today we have jacob rogers with us he is a translator from galician and spanish he has won grants from national endowment for the arts and the penheim translation fund and co-edited features of galician literature for words without borders asymptote and uh, the riveter he has translated manuel rivas the last days of terranova for archipelago books and berta de vilas the dia ones for three times rebel he spoke about his experience of being a bookseller and translator author manuel rivas translations from galician language and about indie publisher archipelago books so welcome to our podcast ashni jacob thanks for having me so when and how did you come across galician literature um so i studied uh spanish sort of later in college i've done it my i went to uh i was lucky enough to go to public schools where we studied spanish since i was like seven but in college i ended up continuing on accident with my spanish and i happened to take a course that was uh specifically focused on the sort of regional complexities of spain and my i asked my professor to just assign me the best possible group of uh students for we had a project where each person each group would do a different region so i just happened to be assigned galicia and i happened to be interested in literature already so i decided that would be my focus is what can i find about the literary culture in galicia um and from there there's a website uh called the portico of galician literature where a galician translator named jonathan dunn has sort of been cataloging Galician writers and been collecting these samples in English these long samples in English as well as biographical information so even before I was able to read Galician I I had this sort of like wealth of stuff in front of me that I could see that there was a lot there um but yeah I just first came across it totally by accident almost <laughs> so, um yeah it was just through that one college class so which is the first book that you read in Galician literature and really liked it That is a difficult question because I have a bad memory and this is almost this is probably about 10 years ago uh but I think may, maybe I'll just say a couple there's one one of my beloved authors who I still work with today Shursho Borathas um he wrote this sort of cult classic insane book called AOA which means I is that's kind of like a road novel where the narrator goes uh is driving down through Portugal and like picks up a hitchhiker and then they just sort of start having sex on the beach all the time um but it there's just this recurring joke throughout where they're in Portugal but they're speaking Galician which is a f- true a true thing that people in Galicia always say you can go to Portugal and just speak Galician and people understand you and so but he's just a really fascinating writer who's like he he's very I don't want to say transgressive because he's not he's not trying to be offensive but he he likes to push boundaries and he's very playful with language so that was like a very great first introduction So Spanish is more fashionable to translate there there is a huge <laughs> contingent of translators why Galician for you Um so I guess going back to that class um that I took when I when I sort of first discovered what it was and all these authors I It was around that time that I was becoming interested in translating in and of itself and I had sort of started to you know there's these famous Argentinian writers like Cortázar who I was I was like oh I'll just translate them just for fun like I know that they've already been published but I think even back then I just kind of had a sense that Spain or Spanish is there's just a lot of it's like you said it's fast there's a lot more people doing it and so it just felt like a crowded a bit of a crowded environment and it just seemed like there was so much in galician and not that there's no one doing it but just that there's so much that so much still had yet to be done and that might be sort of an interesting place for me to see if i could find a sort of make my way and like carve out a little place for myself so somewhat cynical uh to be honest but I uh, it didn't take long for me to just find the enjoyment out of it in and of itself. So Jonathan Dunn I read about him and of course you are there so how many translators are there from Galician to English writing active translators who are doing it. 
regularly? I mean, we could probably say about 10. I'm probably missing some people because, you know, I think I think it's easy to forget that if people aren't publishing all the time, that doesn't mean that they aren't active per se. But yeah, so there's, it's t in terms of pros, there's very few of us. Uh, me, Jonathan Dunn, who's the main, sort of been the main translator of Galician for a long time. Uh, Kathleen March, who's a professor in Vermont. Um, there's another translator, Neil Anderson, who hasn't been as active lately, I don't think. Um, uh, and then poetry, there's actually, I mean, Galician, I know you guys focus mostly on prose in the podcast, but Galician poetry has like a very centuries old tradition and a lot of um, great writers. And so a lot of the translators who work in Galician actually just focus mostly on poetry. Um, like Edin Mode is kind of like a like a god of translation, I think, even to a lot of people in the States, and part of a lot of what she's done has been with Galician. There are about 350,000 people who re who understand Galician, right? All over the world. I, my understanding is the speaker figure, they say, is about 2 million. It's difficult because it's such an emigrant um, region, too, so you have a lot of people who aren't living there who may speak it, but I don't know if they'd be counted. No, no, I'm sorry. Google says it's 40, 4 million people. Oh, 4 million. Okay. Okay. But yeah, and then the reading public is a very different number and probably much smaller. Not that people can't read it, but just how many people are sort of actively reading Galician literature. So most of this uh, get translated into Spanish too? Uh, sadly, not really, to be honest. Not that... So... I think you, you tend to have it happen where there will be a few big authors who are getting a lot of notoriety and being translated into Spanish by major publishing houses. There's been some effort by a couple of the publishing houses to just produce their own Spanish translations. But the, the obvious problem with that is that they're, they already have a Galician audience. That Galician audience doesn't need their Spanish translation. So I'm not sure that anyone is really reading those Spanish translations. Um, so it's actually not nearly as many Spanish um, editions of Galician books that I think I or anyone would like, just because it's, even within Spain, I think it's still sort of on the periphery of literary culture if you're writing in Galician. So it's only every once in a while that you'll get a breakthrough author um, who really just sort of, not just is translated, but actually starts to sort of garner attention in the in the whole country. So you translate from Spanish too, and uh, how similar is Galician to Spanish vocabulary, the way it sounds? Um, they are they are very similar, um, particularly in just in the way that Portuguese and Spanish are very similar, as not just as Romance languages, but you know they develop side by side. Uh, so and Galician historically is the same root as Portuguese. Um, so to some extent, the similarities to Spanish have come in a large way just because they've been sort of in a colonial framework with Spain for, I guess, 500 years. Um, so you've just had a lot of sort of infection of Spanish colloquial language and Spanish words, Spanish phrases, Spanish grammar, but a lot of the backbone of the grammar of Galician is still more close to Portuguese. Um, so when I was first learning, I found that because I already knew Spanish, it was generally very easy to read Galician. The, the way that they, the orthography is much more similar looking to Spanish than it is to Portuguese. Um, and then, it, but to be honest, it kind of depends on the writer. Some people will write in a very quote unquote accessible Galician that has a lot of similarity to Spanish, not similarity, but just sort of has a lot of more common Spanish crossover vocabulary. And then some people are. I don't even know if the words they're using are collected in the dictionary. It's not that they're making them up, but you know, it's it's still the process of normalizing the language, which has its drawbacks, but is is still relatively new. So there's a lot of people who are using words that aren't necessarily accepted as standard, even if we would argue that they are words. So it's it, there's a lot of richness, uh, but it kind of depends author to author. What are the typical challenges you face when translating from Galician to English? So, like in the case of gender. Is it uh, something similar to Portuguese, where you have genders with for adjectives and uh, verbs too? Yes, it's it's the same. Um, 
I think I would say exactly the same Portuguese and Spanish. Uh, yeah, they're 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 entirely gendered in there. Every or almost every adjective will have to correlate to the gender of the subject, um, which you know is one of those things where we have the benefit of not having that in English, but at the same time, because they have it in Galicia and they're able to phrase things some ways that you can use two words in Galicia and that imply a lot more just because you've been able to include the gender where because the gender isn't specified in English, you kind of end up having to use six words just to just to translate two. Um, but then one of the other big challenges is is kind of what I was saying before about the dictionary and the normalizing is because it's a language where there's a lot of controversy, not controversy, but I, it's it's I have like three different Galician dictionary websites that I use that are just in very different place because because the norm the normative the very official normative Galician dictionary misses out on so many things. Um, so I off, there's a there's a dictionary that's more in the Portuguese framework as a Galician dictionary that I tend to find has a lot more definitions. Um, but yeah, sometimes it is just genuinely a challenge figuring out what something means. Um, but, and then the other main thing is that with Spanish, you know, I have such a wealth of forums. Forums are one of the best places to find answers to what things mean. And with Spanish, you just have so much of that with people specifically looking for English translations of Spanish phrases and words. But with Galician, obviously that's not, um, that's not as much of a, or really it's not available at all almost um so it requires a lot more investigation so have you visited galicia uh, yeah actually so after so i first spent they they offer subsidized uh courses in in the language every summer so i did that two summers in a row a long time ago when i was in my early 20s um and they do those in the capital of Santiago, which is also the big pilgrimage site for, for Catholics. Um, so summer, summer is a very crazy time to be there. <laughs> um, but so yeah, I, I had spent a couple months, um, over those summers, but then I also, um, taught English in Spain for a couple of years. And one of those I, I spent in, in Vigo, which is the biggest city in Galicia tied with another, but, um, I think slightly the biggest city. Um, and then, and then like a lot of sort of small, I was on a, actually on a residency there last March, uh, for a month. So I try to make it back as often as I can. So compared to us, uh, I think it must be quite a different experience culturally for you too. Yeah. <laughs> but everyone, you know, when I first went to Spain, everyone would find out that I was on my way to Galicia eventually. And they would, they would all say, oh, you're going to eat so well because Galicia is kind of known within Spain for having some of the some of the best food so it's not a it's not a bad place to be okay. so you translate a lot of poetry too so experientially how do you differentiate between translating poetry and prose to be honest i i don't know if i do enough or maybe it's better that i don't really i think that i have i'm such a sort of a i've i've studied like you know in, in college i actually studied literature but almost entirely was focused on prose and fiction and so I, I think that i have a lot more tools at my disposal to sort of analyze a a fictional text uh, than i do poetry so as a reader of poetry i tend to be a bit uh, obtuse and very like i just know something if i know if i like something or i don't and i don't have i'm not as good at sort of engaging with it on a intellectual or formal level and i, I think that I tend to just translate things that speak to me on that voice level. So I just kind of treat them um, the same as I would a text for the most part. Um, I've definitely avoided things with meter and rhyme that are very structured, or maybe I just haven't noticed, but uh, <laughs> I think I try to avoid anything that will, that will force me to be counting uh, beats or figuring out, um, a, meter, a metrical structure because <laughs> it's in some ways it seems like fun but in some ways it's kind of a nightmare um so yeah i think you know i try to i think poetry did help me translate prose in a way because it does allow you to realize that i think it confronts you sometimes more directly with the fact that you cannot always keep 
the structure exactly as is if you want to bring the same effect across you know if you need five words to translate what was one in the original or two or vice versa sometimes you want to change the line structure so that you can kind of maintain that and so kind of having that realization come to me through poetry i think did actually end up filtering into prose a little bit where i was like well think these don't things don't have to be the way that they are I, what i'm going for is impact and effect and i don't need to just stick to the letter of the law so it was actually very helpful i mean i think for me i think now we will come to the books that you translated. Uh, first one is the Dear Ones from Perta de Villa. Tell us about the book and the author. I guess I was talking earlier about people who managed to break into Spanish and sort of gain more national awareness. She's, I think she's probably the most, I don't know, it's how I, sh I shouldn't say so much because I'm not there, but I, I feel she's one of the more beloved and sort of critically acclaimed writers in Galicia right now. Um, so The Dear Ones was her fourth novel. She's already released another one. She's she's very quick. So uh, it wasn't that long ago that that was her latest novel, but now it's already changed from her to be her second most recent novel. Um, yeah, I mean, I just find I've I've always found her to just be fascinating because I'm not, I don't tend to gravitate towards the more quiet sort of minimalist writers, at least in terms of my, my own translating voice. I, I tend to be gregarious and not know how to finish a sentence. Um, so I've always enjoyed reading her work because she's able to get so much into so little. And that when I first started trying to translate her, I just, it was the big challenge in the way that I like, um, and so then when the dear ones was sold to to this press in the uk uh, i was obviously very excited um and had to do i was like wow i've totally lost my train of thought <laughs> um but anyway so yeah the dear ones the dear ones basically um so it's a book about um it's very meta in the way that it's sort of starts out being about a writer who has has so long avoided writing about pregnancy and motherhood because she she's sort of taking herself to account for saying like for a long time she thought these were not things that were sort of worthy of literature and didn't need to be written about um and of course here we are with this book so she has obviously finally sort of gotten over that feeling and is basically writing about the experience of at one point going through a lot of IVF treatments and having a couple of miscarriages, but still really wanting and trying to have a child. Finally having success, um, going through postpartum depression, um, all of that, and just having a really rough time for about a year before finally sort of getting to a more comfortable place um, mentally and just in terms of life. And then a few years later, um, accidentally getting pregnant again with her other, with her current partner, um, and then deciding to have an abortion, sort of juxtaposed against that, the intensity of the desire for that first child. Um, and, but it, it's, it's an interesting book because she writes it in a way that, you know, the main character is very insistent that she has nothing to feel guilty about for wanting and having the abortion and she's aware and she doesn't feel guilty, but it remains a very difficult thing for her to do just because it's a sort of privacy that you would rather people not be, um, it's a privacy that you would rather people not in, intrude upon and would rather not tell people, but it's sort of hard to avoid in some ways. And she constantly worries if her grandmother finds out what will her grandmother think. But, um, so yeah, it's a very like subtle and, and very beautiful book. Um, and so I'm very glad that it's been translated. Um, but yeah, we uh, she her latest novel is also out now, and I'm working on a co-translation. We're trying to find a publisher. So fingers crossed. Um, I really she's really one of my favorite authors. So I'd like to bring a lot of her work in, or basically all of her work into English. So before we move on to the next book, how do you pick books to translate? Any leaning towards any particular themes or style of writing or? That's a, wow, that's a good question, actually. Yeah. Uh, I, 
I think it's somewhat intuitive. I, I try to re- I, I read a lot in Galicia and I haven't been reading as much lately just because I haven't been there and I already have such a backlog of other things. But I during the year that I spent there in, in, in Galicia and then every other time that I go, I am probably taking out like 10 books a week from the library and not not necessarily finishing them, but I'm just it's this like encyclopedic sort of impulse where I just am trying to wrap my head around what's out there and like try to find what I like and stick with that. And so I'll, I'll find an author. And then if I like one book, I'll sort of try to track down everything else they do. But so, yeah, it's mostly intuitive. I just try to gravitate towards what I like. And then a little bit of a calculation will come in where I'll think, well, is this, I, I should also say I work as a bookseller in the, in the U S so I have a, I, I like to think I have a good sense of especially the independent presses here. So I'm always kind of thinking like, is there someone I can think of who might want to publish this? And I haven't been successful in that front, so I shouldn't make it sound like this is some special knowledge that I have and it's served me greatly. But yeah, I'm always first going by like, did I like it? Did it really like interest me and like stimulate me in a way that I think that I would enjoy translating it? And then secondly, do I think there's actually someone who would publish it or you know does it is it going to sort of resonate at all um which can be hard because sometimes if something feels like it's so particular and so galician in its context that people might not understand it it's like oh it's a great book but i'm not sure if i could convince someone like how do i explain this book to someone who doesn't have the sort of the background uh like there was a there was a major book that won a prize a few years ago that was sort of based on this mythology that has come up around what this man who's or this person who was sort of colloquially referred to, I think, as the world's first serial killer, um, who was around, I want to say, in the 19th century in, in Galicia and and killed a lot of women and et cetera. And he's always had this and he was known as the the wolf man. Uh, for a long time for, I actually am not as familiar with this as I should be, but the point being, there was some research that came out, uh, based on some bones that were found that maybe, um, this person was actually intersex. Um, and so this writer wanted to write a book about, uh, sort of used going off of that and like, and if it wasn't actually, um, a man, but was an intersex person and that was, all invested but it's just written in such a way that it doesn't it's very poetic and it doesn't give you a lot of context so if you don't know what's going on and so it's like it's a beautiful amazing novel but i just was like i don't think it, i don't know if anyone would really get this at all in english so i'm not sure that it you know like i, I don't think it would really land because you just wouldn't know i i barely knew it was happening sometimes i think because i don't have enough context but yeah i guess that's a long way of explaining that point <laughs> Any interesting interactions with the authors about the way you translate it? Um, to be honest, I've been extremely lucky in that sense. I don't know that I've, maybe I've repressed it, but I don't think I've ever really gotten into proper arguments with anyone in general. Um, I, I've basically only had great experiences with, um, e- including even the people I translate in Spanish, but in Galician, I think especially just because a lot of these people aren't even necessarily being translated into Spanish. And so I think it, it's just kind of exciting. Even if we just get like a short story published in a magazine, there's something so sort of, I, you know, like if I were a writer, I think just the act of like having someone approach you and say that their work is valuable to the, your work is valuable to them and they would like to bring it to other people. Um, so I think, so generally I've found people to be extremely generous with their time, especially because I tend to, ask a lot of questions and always feel, I always send emails with a whole paragraph apologizing for all the questions, which are each like a paragraph long. Um, but I, and I've, I've had a few, the, the first writer I mentioned, Shursho Borathas is actually, uh, he translates from English, um, and is, I think better at English than I am. And so I, I have always, whenever I've translated something by him, I've always sent him the, the drafts and he, he always has amazing comments and like, suggests things that are, I would never even have occurred to me. Um, but I mean, mainly I'm just happy. I've been able to meet a lot of my, the writers that I work with in person. Um, 
which is just a lot more fun when you can like go out to dinner and get a drink um, and just sort of relate as two people rather than just over email. Um, so yeah, been very fortunate. Specific question is about uh, being a bookseller and translator. <laughs> <laughs> so I, f I first started working as a bookseller actually right when I got out of college uh, in North Carolina. Um, and it wasn't so and then I moved to New York a few years ago and have been working again as a bookseller here. But early on, it was actually sort of a great cheat code where I could I could get in touch with all these independent presses that publish translation as a bookseller, you know, oh, would you guys mind sending these books? And then I would say, by the way, I'm also, I'm also a translator uh, in case you'd ever be interested in uh, reading Galician books. Did it work? Yes and no. Yes, to the extent that it was a nice way to sort of start the conversation. And in a lot of cases, there are people I'm, I, I still feel comfortable reaching out to. But no, just in the sense that I haven't published a book with any of them yet. Um, not for a lack of trying. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so in general, it's just been great as a translator because um, I'm, I'm, it gives me this access to a lot of especially small press books between my discount and just being able to get galleys where I, I try to read a lot of what the independent presses are putting out. And, and in some cases, the, the more like mainstream big five. So it's, you know, it's like I said earlier that I, I always have this like encyclopedic impulse with Galician, but I, I kind of have the same thing here where it's, I'm just trying to always see who's publishing what and what kind of thing and languages. So in that way, it's really nice, but also, uh, I, I actually have always genuinely loved working in a bookstore. Um, and just, I, I like talking to people in a just sort of casual way. It's just nice to be able to, I think, especially when you're doing a job like translation, so many, some days, you know, you just sit at home on your computer silently or maybe with music, but you're, it's just a very solitary task. And so to be able to alternate that with a job where I'm very distinctly sort of social. So yeah, it's it's just been nice being able to alt a very solitary task with something that's just outwardly sort of more focused around talking to people and being social. But they go so well together because I'm working on books at home, but I also get to talk about books um, at work. Um, and, you know, it's it's having coworkers who are also reading all the time. It's just a very nice ecosystem to be in where you just get to sort of, in some cases, speak ill of uh, certain things in a more in an environment that's safe uh, and comfortable to speak ill of things where you might not do so publicly. <laughs> um, but also just to really gush about things, and you know, people come in looking for recommendations, and uh, and oftentimes, you know, they they may be looking for one thing, but you can always try to recommend something that they might not have picked up on their own, like a independent press or a translated book. Um, I wouldn't say that that's like the norm of every recommendation, but you know, you get those little glimpses into sort of opening people's um, sort of reading journey, I guess, opening that up a little bit and showing them things that they haven't really encountered before. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely a lot of fun. Also, sometimes I, uh, you know, publishers or other writers or translators will just sort of pop in uh, just cause they're, trying to go to a bookstore. So it kind of is like a nice way just to occasionally see people. Spanish government, uh, does it uh, um, help or encourage translations from Galician to English in, in any way? The Spanish government doesn't provide encouragement per se, but right now, because they're governed by, uh, it's called the PSOE, which is the sort of generally understood as the central, central left socialist party. They, they aren't necessarily pro regional language and pro regional sort of difference, but they've had to form a coalition with a lot of regional sort of more regional government backgrounds. And so since they've been in power for the past few years, the, the system of, um, the system of grants and so especially around getting, uh, funding for contracted published books has been made a lot easier. And again, I, I actually should know more about this, but my sense is that because it's somewhat of a coalition government, they they have been more proactive about offering funding and, and really encouraging the funding 
really overstating the emphasis that the funding is available to all languages of Spain that are officially recognized. Um, so even if, if I'm translating a Galician language book, I know I can apply for Spanish government funding, um, which is mostly important because Spain is known for having one of the most stupidly complex bureaucracies around even, and, I, and you know, it's a, it's sort of a trope, but it is true when it's come to translation funding that they're ranked pretty low by most government, most people who are trying to translate out of Spanish or a Spanish language is just, you're trying to get a few thousand euros and it's just paperwork and paperwork and paperwork and they want all this information, but they've, they've made it a lot easier in the past few years, uh, which has been great because the Galician government, which has been, uh, sort of the center right party for probably about 15 years now is, is definitely slowly strangling the Galician language and ostensibly they, you know, they do offer funding for book projects. Um, it's not a, at a number that really kept up with the pace of inflation and X, Y, Z. But even though the funding is available, it is one of the most, uh, another translator friend of mine who works from Galician, Keith Payne, has referred to it as Kafkaesque, the, the process of applying for funding from Galicia. Though I, I actually have not, I have two books out from Galician and neither one of them has received funding from the Galician government. All right, sorry, three. The first one received funding is through Jonathan's publisher. The other two, I, I just said, look, I think it's much easier to get it from Spain right now. So if you want, if you value your life or your sanity, don't try with the Galician government. Um, but yeah, so hopefully the, unfortunately the Galicia just had its elections and the, the same party narrowly held onto its majority. So we're in for a few more years of this, but it looks like the, the sort of, um, much more progressive left is gaining ground. So my fingers are crossed. Yeah. No, the other, other one, uh, I wanted to talk to you about, uh, the book is, uh, the last days of Terra Nova. Uh, by Emmanuel Rivas. It's published by Archipelago Publications. The publisher, can you, this name keeps recurring in many of the interviews that we do, Archipelago. Can you tell us a bit about them? So I think they've been around for a little over 20 years uh, and were found, I want to say founded by Jill Schoolman, who's still the publisher now. Um, I, I mean, I guess I can't speak too much to their specific ethos, but they, they've definitely just become known as one of those publishers that, that have not only have they just published a lot of great literature, they, they do try to reach pretty far and wide in terms of the languages they publish. Um, so I remember years and years ago, it was very meaningful for me because I was just getting into translation. They had this really giant, uh, Bulgarian novel translated by Angela Rodell. And just, you know, I remember reading it. I was like 20 years old and I was like, oh my God, like this is so good. I can't believe this exists. And so I think, yeah, they've just sort of become known for having a sort of the courage to also just like go out there for books that might have a hard time finding a more sort of mainstream publisher, but also books that are very long and, and can be a little bit too expensive for others to, to translate. Um, and Jill is just one of those people who has like a really good, She's just very perspicacious, I think, about the kinds of things she picks up. She's, she just kind of knows, you know, she has her taste, but you, she's someone that's definitely worth keeping an eye on in terms of like, she has her finger on the pulse. She just, yeah, you know, she, she has had her, she's, she's liked and followed Manuel Rivas's work for a long time and just never been able to publish him before. But, um, you know, so she's been sort of aware of this Galician author for years. Um, she just, yeah, I don't know. It's very, and then the, the rest of the team is also very great. But I guess the other thing is that they're a nonprofit, I think. So that allows them to get, um, you know, allows them to apply for a lot of grants and receive donations in a way, in a more direct way. And I think that's one of the big, it helps them to sort of keep things afloat, um, and not have to always focus on book sales strictly. Um, this is, we're talking about translated books. They don't always sell very well. Um, so it's part of what I think allows them to have that sort of broad, more intrepid approach. Now, tell us about uh, Manuel Rivas. I think he's a very prolific writer. In yeah, yes. I mean, I don't even, I couldn't, he's written so much poetry, so many 
works of prose. Uh, he's, he's definitely the most widely translated into English as well. Um, so what I was just mentioning, um, he, he, I think five or six of his novels have been translated into English by Jonathan Dunn um, for an uh, imprint of Penguin over the years. Um, and it, So this Archipelago book was the first of his novels to be translated outside of that framework. Um, but I know Jonathan has published a couple, I think one of his short story collections, and then uh, there's an Irish translator, Lorna Shaughnessy, who's worked on some of his poetry. So he's definitely already the most prolific in English, but within Galicia, he's like a legend. Um, he, he, is, he is definitively famous, I think, as a writer in Spain as a whole, but in Galicia, he's one of those authors that I always joke, people like to gossip over there as they do anywhere, but uh, I have only ever heard the nicest things about him as a person from every single person I've ever met and talked to about him. So aside from the fact that he's just had the status as a, you know, one of their best writers, I think that part of it is just that everyone who ever meets him is just like taken by his, he's very humble and very kind. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, he, so he wrote, I think the book that kind of made him, the book that brought him the most notoriety, I think in general is called the carpenter's pencil. Um, so he's, you know, he's written a lot of historical fiction that deals with the, the civil war and the pre-civil war, particularly in Galicia. Um, and he just has this very, he's one of those writers who, you know, he really just has sort of taken the language and made it his own. And he just, it feels completely embodied in his work. Um, so he's extremely fun to translate because you can just feel the richness and the, the elusiveness. He's, and he's an amazing reader. I think he's read, I don't even, I mean, I can't imagine how many books, um, but so he has, yeah, he has this very beautiful, almost lyrical style. Um, and I think that's part of what has helped make him so popular. Um, but also he just has a very deep, I think, human in them. Like all of his books, um, even if they're about very dark things, I think they're essentially optimistic at their core and they're very interested in humans being not necessarily good people, but just sort of like they're, they're interested in exploring people with a sense of optimism, even when we're talking about people who do horrible things, like who are the people working against them and like, what can we explore with that? Um, of course, like many films have been made, he's had some big films be made out of his short stories. Um, we even watched one when I was in college, unrelated to being a Galician writer. It was just, you know, he's just that big that, you know, you might watch one of his movies when you're studying Spanish. The last days of uh, Terra Nova, I just started reading, in fact, a couple of days ago. It was 30, 40 pages, 25, 30 pages. I found it a bit abstract. So what is it about? Can you please? Uh, you, you're not wrong. You're, 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 you're not wrong. It's very meandering. Uh, the, the basic premise is that it's about a, an older man who runs a, a bookstore in the city of Acoruña, which is... Um, the basically the second biggest city or co-biggest city in Galicia and sort of the cosmopolitan heart of the region. Um, so he runs this bookstore, but he's just had to put up a sign that he's uh, closing the bookstore imminently because his his landlord is basically just going to tear down the building and build something new. He's a real estate speculator. So it starts off with him sort of walking around on his cane um, he used to have polio and he's just sort of wandering around the city, ruminating, um, being mad at himself for putting up the sign that he's closing the store. Um, and he goes out to one of the, um, one of the overlooks of the sea because it's on the, the city's on the coast and it has a very sort of dramatic, dangerous coastline with a lot of rocks. And he sees this couple that he's seen out there a lot and they're, um, gathering, um, they're gathering shellfish along the rocks, even though there's a massive storm on the way. So uh, when he sees them in danger, he, he calls the police. Um, and then obviously, they, you know, because he, he's not trying to get them in trouble. He just thinks that they're maybe about to die. Um, so he calls the police and tries to get a rescue helicopter out there. Obviously, they, they're not trying to get caught, so they run away. Um, but basically, it ends up being that they... The, the young woman of the couple is pregnant and they actually are kind of on the run from some people in Portugal. Anyway, so they, they end up breaking into the bookstore and needing to take refuge there, um, which sends him on this sort of 
odyssey of memory where most of the book actually takes place with him sort of meandering through various parts of his life um, because it basically sends him back to a time when he had uh, known this Argentinian woman who had been in the um, the very militant left during the, the dictatorship years in, in Argentina. And she had to flee Argentina basically on fear that they were going to kill her. Um, and he meets her in Madrid, but then takes her back to, to Galicia where his parents own this bookstore. And they, you know, they're basically hiding her there because they know there are agents in Spain looking for her as well. So the, the sort of correlation of the giving refuge to this sort of vulnerable young woman in the one time and then the other sends them on this memory, you know, and he was into like the punk and the metal band scene back in the seventies. So it just kind of goes all over the place. It's like a, it's kind of a noir novel. There's like a, there's like a drug and like whatever aspect, but it's also a sentimental thing. It's also a historical novel. So it, it's, uh, yeah, it's doing a lot. So any, particular passage where you found it uh, difficult to translate, difficulty in translation, where you had to spend a lot of time? One of the overall challenges is just that he references so many books and uses so many different languages, um, but in particular books that haven't always been translated into English. So I just found myself faced often with questions of he's just using Italian, but like, can I just use Italian or like, you know, things like that. Um, I don't think there is any specific passage, but he, he just has in some cases like a sense of, a sense of humor that can be, you know, it's, it's one of those things where the joke is the joke. And I don't think his sense of humor doesn't come across in English, but sometimes you just really have to work to, you really have to change a sentence to really like give it a, a sort of pop in English. And so those, those were probably the most challenging parts because it's really throughout the whole book, whether it's a certain character who just tends to be funny or just the narrative voice. But those are also, I, I really enjoy funny books. Uh, so those were also the parts that I think I was having the most fun with and the parts that as I read, whenever I read it back, I was sort of a little maybe too pleased with myself when I, when I read it back and just think, ha ha, I did it. <laughs> Can you read a couple of paragraphs uh, from the book, both in Galician and in English? Um, so I'm going to read just a short bit um, from the first from the first chapter. Basically, it's it's right after the narrator Vicenzo has called the police, um, but now the police have come to talk to him because they, you know, they brought out a helicopter and nothing happened. Um, so it's just this short, uh, short little bit of dialogue that I think is is fun um the sea was getting ready to claim them but in the end it was the earth that swallowed them up the first policeman to get out of his car could tell i was agitated and tried to calm me down don't worry about them they're like jellyfish transparent but any day now they're going to be in for a nasty surprise and not in the water on land they don't have papers and there's some hot-headed guys with license who would love to knock the teeth out of their smiles the sergeant came up and greeted me, and not rudely, either. Ah, so you're Mr. Fontana, the Terranova bookman. He, at least, hadn't read the total liquidation sign. He wouldn't stop looking at me, a glimmer of curiosity in his eyes. The disappearance of the Monelos River. I'll never forget that, I say. It was a formal complaint. I know, I still have a copy. I have a copy of all the complaints you've filed. The disappearance of Parrote Beach, the expulsion of starlings from the city sky, the eviction of fishermen's boats from the marina as a way to make room for aluminum yachts, the neglect of Art Nouveau buildings, the decrepit state of the old prison. You're right, Mr. Fontana, that prison could be a cultural space. Yes, sir, they're like historical artifacts. Your complaints, I mean, an alternative history to this city. To think how much I've learned from them, it brings a smile to my face every time you file a complaint. I'm glad you've enjoyed reading them, Sergeant, but you should do your due diligence. Of course, the cases are open, he said, gesturing at some point on high. Speaking of due diligence, said the corporal, you're going to have to pay for this. He appeared the most, to be the most veteran among them, his hair white and his tone commanding, not just towards me, but to everyone in the vicinity, including his superior. Pay for what? I asked. What do you mean, what? This rescue operation. Do you know how expensive it is to get a helicopter off the ground? Sure, but it was an emergency. They were drowning. 
two people and one of them was pregnant. You can write that novel for the government delegation when they send you the bill. They were in danger, I insisted, looking at the sergeant. I know, Mr. Fontana, you did your citizenly duty, but it's just one of those cases where the regulations have two faces, one human and the other not so much. Well, I called the human side. Don't beat yourself up about it, said the sergeant. The corporal took down the license plate number on the old motorcycle left by the clandestine couple. It was an old, it was an old model, mud caked and run down. He gazed out at the rocks once he'd finished. The sea was looking choppier. The inundation was on its way. Now that the sergeant is gone, he said, I have to admit, I like your complaints too. And I'm sorry about the starling. I didn't sign up to be a human cannon and scare them all off with gunfire. But I do have to disagree with you about the disappeared river. It was just a stream, a shitty little stream. Corot, Corot, I said nervously. Corot painted streams like that, and they're works of art. He clicked his tongue and said, you must not have had anything better to paint. Read the Galician now. Estivo a piques de levalo su mar e agora tragaraos a terra. O primeiro garda que baixou do coche policial viu-me inquieto e tentou tranquilizar-me. Não se preocupe por eles. São como medusas, transparentes. Pero calquera dia levan um disgusto. Não do mar, senão da terra. Não têm papéis, e o seu carné, como lhes coza o xenio, van lhes dar unha malheira. Achegou-se o sargento, saudou-me, e não com má cara. Assim que você de Fontana, o libreiro de Terra Nova. Por lo menos ele não era o letreiro de liquidação final. Não deixava de mirarme com curiosidade. A desaparição do rio Moleros. Esse foi um texto antológico. Foi uma denúncia, disse. Sim, sí, conservo uma cópia. Conservo cópia de todas as suas denúncias. A desaparição da praia do Parrote, a expulsão dos estorninhos do Ceo da Cidade, o desalojo dos barcos marineños da Dársena para meter os yates de aluminio, o abandono das casas de Arnubó, o estado ruinoso da antiga prisão modelo. Tem razão você, podia ser um grande obradoiro de cultura. Sim, sí, senhor. São peças históricas. A melhor memória da cidade. O que se aprende nelas. Dá-me uma alegria cada vez que presenta uma denúncia. Agradeço muito seu interesse estelístico, sargento, pero alguma vez deveriam abrir diligencias. Falando de diligencias, interveio o cabo. Vai ter que pagar os gastos. Semellava o mais veterano, de pelo esbrancuxado de cuntão de mando que não só me apuntava a mim, senão a todo o orbe, mesmo o seu superior. Que gastos? Perguntei. Que gastos? Os gastos que se derivam da operação. Você sabe o que custa mover um helicóptero? Sim, sí, pero foi uma chamada humanitária. Estavam afogando. Duas pessoas. Uma delas uma mocinha preñada. Pois vai escribindo essa novela para quando a nossa delegação do governo com a factura. Eran duas pessoas em perigo, insisti mirando o sargento. Por suposto, Fontana. Você cumpriu com o dever cidadão, mas dan-se esses paradoxos em, em que os regulamentos legais adoitam ter duas caras, uma humana e outra menos humana. Pois eu chamei a cara humana. Não se culpa, dice, dixo o sargento. O cabo anotava a matrícula da moto abandonada por os dois fugitivos, uma máquina bella enlamada e abatida. O rematar, miró caras rochas. O mar ia a mais. Achegábase o temporal. Agora que non está o sargento, dixo, debo reconhecer que a mim tamén me gusta moito as súas denuncias. E sinto os estorniños. Eu non quixen facer de home canón para escorrentalos a estoupidos. Ainda que discrepo no asunto do riado desaparecido. Era un regato. Unha merda de ri. Corrot. Corrot, dixe nervioso. Corrot pintou regatos así. Son obras de arte. Chascou a lingua e dixo. Pois non teria outra cosa que pintar. Thank you. Thank you for such an enjoyable, wonderful conversation. And thank you for your time. Yeah, I mean, thank you. I really appreciate you making the time. It was a lot of fun. <laughs>